Most of the rest of the Bill of Rights deals with what happens when you get accused of a crime. Um, in fact, the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th apply specifically to defendants' rights. And we're talking about interpreting defendants' rights. Now, this is an ongoing process, and it's really changed dramatically in the last 50 years or so. And there's some chance it'll continue to change dramatically going forward. Now, let's talk about the Second Amendment real quick, your right to bear arms. The common uh, national, state, and local gun laws are things like restrictions on owning and carrying handguns, background checks, limiting the sale of certain types of weapons, the requirements of how guns can be stored. Uh, in some states, you have, you have to take classes before you can hold certain types of guns or, or have concealed weapons. The courts have ruled uh, con fairly consistently that the government can regulate your right to own a gun. Now, this is a very hot topic, and I'm sure people will get upset to hear me say that. I'm just saying that that has traditionally been the ruling of the court. Um, and, and, but if you want to talk about that, we can talk about it next time we get together. Many advocates of gun control argued that the Second Amendment applied only to the rights of the states to create militias, which, uh, quite frankly, from a historical standpoint, seems to be true. And in fact, what it says is, in order to maintain a well-regulated militia, uh, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Uh, and so that, that is right there in the amendment. Although there are many people out there who are kind of Second Amendment absolutist who believe there should no, be zero restrictions at all on the right to hold a gun. In the District of Columbia v. Heller, a 2008 case, the individual right to possess a firearm was, was, was guaranteed whether or not they are connected with a militia. And the use of that arm uh, for traditionally lawful purposes like self-defense within the home or hunting or target practice, things like that, uh, was, was protected as well. And we currently have a court that's, that's fairly friendly to gun rights. Um, there's been some debate over whether or not Heller incorporated the Second Amendment. Uh, uh, largely because the District of Columbia is not a state and is ruled in a different way. Uh, but it does seem to suggest that incorporation for gun rights is on the way. Here's a little chart showing you the, the rights we're about to talk about. Um, and you can stop and read this if you'd like, but I'm going to talk about these individually anyway going forward. The, the most fun to talk about are searches and seizures. The Fourth Amendment says that the government cannot uh, search uh, your property or seize anything you own without um, one of, uh, of three things, probable cause, a warrant, or your permission. Uh, well, a warrant is when you go to a judge and they give you, uh, the judge says you can do it. Uh, your permission is when you tell them it's okay, and I, and I always have to tell kids this. If the cops come knock on your door and ask if they can come look around, and you say yes, you can come look around, they don't need a warrant or probable cause. You told them they could. If they pull you over and ask to look in your trunk and they find the chopped up body of your girlfriend, that's your fault. You told them they could open the trunk. Those warrants and, and permission are fairly simple. The third thing is probable cause, and this one gets a little complicated. If the police have a reason to believe that a person should be arrested or that a crime has been committed or being committed, um, they can search wherever they want. Uh, so let's talk about this for a minute. If a cop is walking down the street and he hears somebody scream, he can go investigate what the scream was. If uh, there's the odor of decomposing dead bodies coming from your house, they can go knock on your door and ask to look around your house. These are probable cause, right? If you're doing 90 down uh, the, the highway, uh, they can claim that that's probable cause that you might be fleeing a scene and they can search your car. Now, what's probable cause and what isn't comes down to what a judge decides it is. So depending on the judge and where you're at, it may be stricter or looser. Uh, but I'll give you one example for the high school kids out there. Um, if a cop pulls up to a house and there's 75 teenagers standing around with red cups and they all drop them and run inside the house when they see the cop, that's probable cause, guys. They can at that point search your house fairly easily, and I don't think many judges will argue. But if there is an unreasonable search and seizure, the evidence obtained in this manner will be uh, thrown out of the court case. It doesn't mean you're innocent. Uh, a lot of people have this perception that if the cop break one little rule, you just go free. That's not true at all. The exclusionary rule, which is established in Map v. Ohio in 1961, um, simply says that that evidence can't be used. So let's say that a cop comes to your house and they have a warrant to search your garage. And while searching your garage, they have to go to the bathroom. They go to the bathroom and they, while in the bathroom, they see the chopped up body of your girlfriend in the bathtub. Um, that evidence was illegally obtained, assuming you didn't give them permission to go to the bathroom, uh, because they went somewhere they didn't have the right to be. Now, they can still build a case and arrest you and throw you in jail for killing her. They just can't use her body as evidence because that was obtained illegally. Um, the, the, the exclusionary rule has been further refined to say that minor errors on warrants no longer prevent you uh, 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 from being able to search. So, for example, the, the clerk who typed it up 
uh, put the wrong zip code on the warrant, that will no longer prevent um, the evidence from being used. Self-incrimination. The Fifth Amendment says that you can't be forced to incriminate yourself. This means you can't be put on the stand against your will if you can face criminal punishment, and your wife can't either, by the way. Now, if you cannot face criminal punishment, you can definitely be put on the stand, which is why they give lower-level criminals immunity so many times to force them to testify on higher-level criminals. Because if you've been given immunity, you can no longer face punishment. They can compel you to testify. Uh, but if you don't get immunity, you can't be compelled to testify. Uh, police have to inform you of these rights, uh, that you have the right to not testify. This is established in the Miranda v. Arizona case. This is where a guy is arrested. He speaks little or no English. Um, he has a confession beat out of him by Arizona police. And uh, uh, he will sue in, uh, uh, under the grounds that um, he was not informed of his Fifth Amendment rights. And after this, cops were told they had to uh, read... Uh, a suspects their rights, and this is why in every cop show you've ever seen, uh, you they you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Those are called your Miranda rights, and that little card is called uh, your Miranda uh, a Miranda card. By the way, uh, in 1991, the court ruled that not being read, read your Miranda rights uh, didn't automatically let you out of jail. Uh, they had to not read you your Miranda rights and then do something like trick you into confessing or something. Um, and so if it's a harmless error, meaning it didn't impact how the case went, even not being read your rights isn't going to help you. You can also, cops cannot, uh, can also not um, uh, trick you into committing a crime. If they offer to sell you drugs, let's say, and you buy the drugs, you've been entrapped because they offered it. Uh, you have to be the one who brings it up. The right to counsel. This is the Sixth Amendment. The state must provide lawyers in most criminal cases. This is the fantastic story of Gideon V. Wainwright. This is a guy who breaks into a house and uh, gets caught and gets sent to jail. And while in jail, he spends his time in the prison library and he writes what's called a pauper's petition. He puts together his own argument, arguing that he should have been provided an attorney. The Supreme Court takes up his argument, rules in his favor, and it is established that uh, if, you are, if you are charged with a crime where you can be put into jail, as a consequence, the court must provide you an attorney if you can prove that you can't afford one. And that's the great Gideon v. Wainwright case. Trials. The vast majority of trials are resolved through plea bargaining, and there is no trial. 90% of cases go this way. So basically, you're charged with first-degree murder, and the, uh, the government comes to you and says, we'll knock it down to homicide um, if you just plead guilty. And so uh, that's how most cases get resolved. But if it does go to court, you do have a right to a jury, both in criminal and civil cases. You have to ask for one. The government won't necessarily give you one. Um, it, but if you ask for one, uh, you can have one. Most juries consist of 12 people, but that's not always true. Usually, all, all the people in the jury have to vote to convict you, but that's also, depending on the state and the crime you're charged with, not always true as well. The Sixth Amendment also guarantees you a speedy and public trial. Cruel and unusual punishment. The Eighth Amendment forbids cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, the death penalty at times has been ruled cruel and unusual punishment, although currently, and for many decades now, it has not been considered cruel and unusual punishment. Although it can only be used for the most extreme crimes. There was an interesting case a while back where Louisiana wanted to make child rape punishable uh, by the death penalty, and the court said no, you have to have a murder involved for the death penalty to be implied. In Gregg v. Georgia in 1976, uh, they actually ruled the death penalty unconstitutional, although a few years later um, uh, they brought it back. I want to talk about the death penalty, do some more death penalty cases real quick. In Witherspoon v. Illinois in 1968, a death sentence was overturned because between the time the guy was found guilty and the time he was sent to death, they asked everybody who opposed the death penalty to leave before sentencing um, and so uh, to make sure that he could get the death penalty. In Furman v. Georgia in 1972, they found that the uh, that Georgia's death penalty was freakish and random in the way that it virtually always applied the death penalty when available to minorities and almost never applied the death penalty when available to um, uh, 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 whites. In Woodson v. North Carolina of 1976, uh, they ruled against mandatory death penalties. That is to say, if you're found guilty of crime A, you have to get the death penalty. Oh, I should also point out in cruel and unusual punishment, sorry. 
that uh, lately, of course, the government's use of techniques like waterboarding and stress positions that some people call torture. Uh, many people have argued this is a violation of the Eighth Amendment uh, prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment, but unfortunately uh, the courts haven't weighed in on that, so it just remains an ongoing debate uh, over whether it's not, and it doesn't look like the courts plan on weighing in on it. Other interesting cases regarding the death penalty will be issues like, is it okay to execute a minor um, or somebody who is, say, uh, uh, mentally retarded? Uh, the court has made it more difficult to do this, um, but it is constitutionally acceptable in, in both cases, and Texas has done both uh, in the not-too-distant past.